You're listening to episode 22 of the Decorate Like a Design Boss podcast. And on today's episode, we are diving into a soulful topic, pardon the pun, but we are talking about the soul of your home. This one is going to be good because a home without a soul is only a structure and it has no heartbeat. So let's get started. Welcome to Decorate Like a Design Boss, a podcast for design lovers who want to create beautiful spaces in their very own homes. My name is Kimberly Grigg, and I'm a professional interior designer who teaches design lovers like yourselves how to decorate. And when I say decorate, I mean decorate like a design boss. If you're ready to create a space that your family loves and your neighbors can't stop raving about, well, buckle up, honey, because it's time to design. Hello there, my favorite people. If you are here, then chances are you're an interior designophile, one who loves interior design, but mostly one who loves her home. You probably lie awake at night wondering if your home decor is just right. You experiment. You search for good ideas. You wrestle with things throughout your home. You're willing to try new things. You scour Pinterest. You sign up for all the home tours. And you genuinely care that your home puts its best foot forward. You constantly seek to find the heartbeat of your spaces and you work tirelessly to style your baby just right. If this is you, well then, you're in the right place as this podcast and my entire platform is all about teaching you how to create a beautiful, well-designed space, but one that resonates with you. I want to teach you how to be your own interior designer and to stop wasting money on design gone bad. Did you know that you can obtain this kind of knowledge and lots of it by simply joining my Insiders Club? It is here that I offer over 100 hours of interior design video trainings along with my Fundamentals of Interior Design course. In this club, I host a monthly Zoom virtual group design consult meet where I come into someone's home and do a full analysis and help you solve your design dilemmas. This normally would cost $350 alone, but it is free to the Insiders Club. You can submit your questions or listen along and learn. Everyone has a voice in this virtual meetup, and you'll gain so much one-on-one personal attention and knowledge. You'll also have access in our club to our private and very robust Facebook group. So why not join now? Normally, the cost of the membership is $24.99 a month but you can access it now via this podcast for $19.99 a month. All you have to do is go to the show notes and click on the link. Now, on to this episode. So, I have designed spaces, both large and small, and, I have to say, on a multitude of budgets. Some very small and some very large. People ask me often, what is your favorite project? The reply is not always the grandest multi-million dollar mansion, but instead, my preference is I love it when a home has a soul and when I get to help a client attain this. One of the loveliest projects ever was for an aging widow who has always, always loved her home. She had had beautiful spaces and collected a variety of things over the years. She was downsizing at this point into a 2,500 square foot three bedroom. My task was to call her 
inventory, which is what I refer to as the things you already own, and create a new look with them and add pieces if necessary, along with drapery and accessories that would simply pull it all together. Well, this was no small feat as her existing space was quite large, but she also wanted to do this on a limited budget as she was planning to travel a lot, so the maintenance, investment, and upkeep on the new space was to be minimal. Well, I guess I love a good challenge, and this one was no exception because I knew she wouldn't be happy unless the space actually felt luxurious and fit the needs of the new lifestyle that she was dreaming of. So, where do I start? Where to begin? As with every project, the best place to start is at the beginning. Again, no pun intended. And the beginning here for any project in my book is with a personality assessment of this client. Let's just call her Ina. I discovered that Ina was a tiger by nature, which means she loves the latest trends and she wants her home to reflect this. She wanted her space to be dramatic yet soulful. You can assess your own personality by going back to episode one of this podcast. This knowledge is the backbone of creating a soulful home. Next, I gave Ina my foolproof design DNA test, which you can also learn about in episode two. And finally, I discovered that Ina's style was a mismatch of Dorothy Draper, who was colorful and who used bold curvy lines mixed with Humphrey Bogart, who stands for classic and timeless elegance. You can learn more about how to define your own style by listening to episode three. All right, now I'm going to quit pointing out episodes, but these three are so very important to the success of your designs. I point this out not because I'm trying to tout my podcast, but because I know for sure that if you're going to have a soulful home, you have to know these three things to make this happen. So I've never had a successful soulful project when I didn't understand these three things about my client or even myself. I learned in this analysis that Ina was going to need beauty first, color second, elegance and ease third, and function fourth. Every decision I would make going forward would be based on this criteria. So, step one in creating a soulful home is know thy soul. Now, I began the editing process. I got to know Ina very well, and I walked through her home multiple times while I asked her repeatedly to tell me about the various items that she owned, many of which had a story, and I discovered that Ina had traveled quite a bit and that travel in faraway places were really important to her. I knew that I would need to incorporate those special pieces into new groupings and that I would need to make sure that I included the ones that seemed the most important to her. Now, because I was totally unattached to her things, I was able to see what Ina was not able to discern on her own. She was attached to all of it, of course, but she was actually more attached to certain things. I watched for this like a hawk as I was determined what I would use and what would go. I needed to make these decisions for Ina. I also knew that her pieces were valuable and They shouldn't just go into a junk pile. I needed to do something worthwhile with them. Getting rid of items can be really treacherous, especially if you attach sentimental value to many of them or if you attach a dollar amount to them. So don't let yourself get stuck here. Sometimes you need an outsider to help you with this. Maybe it's a trusted friend or a relative 
to help you make these decisions, or perhaps it's a design professional who realizes that you're a person who likes to decorate in a meaningful, soulful way. Just remember, for the most part, when downsizing or culling for a soulful home, you do have to assess what really speaks to you and, sorry folks, you have to be willing to get rid of the rest. So, step two is assess and edit. Editing can often be the most difficult part of the process. Well, it's really hard to part with things, especially if they cost a lot of money. But you must remember, a soulful home contains only the most special of items. This is a hard concept, and trust me, I know firsthand. I love beautiful things, and I have too many. But every year in January, I go through and I call. Things I don't truly love, things I never use, and things that no longer bring me true joy have to go. I either donate, give to loved ones, or sell. And this is exactly what we're going to do for Ina. First, I tagged everything that I knew we would keep and that we would use in the new space. Then Ina invited her niece in to take what she might want. Next, we had a good old-fashioned estate sale. This was not a yard sale, but an estate sale, as Ina's pieces were of very high quality and good value. I didn't want to get yard sale prices for these items. I wanted them to go to the best of homes, and I wanted to create a situation where we gleaned top dollar. After this, I added Globetrotter to Ina's design DNA profile and knew that I wanted to represent this in some way in the new space. This would also allow me to incorporate a variety of her items into a more collected look that would feel comfortable and homey, yet fresh and inspiring and interesting in her new space. In one word, I describe Ina's style as a wanderlust. All right, we're on to step three. Step three is where it really gets interesting because this is where you'll want to pull it all together. I knew that we were going to incorporate Ina's favorite colors, which were bold and bright. She was not a neutral girl. And that the palette had to support Ina's life experiences. So, step three is to create a color palette. Now, notice I did not say yet what color I was going to put on the walls because if you know me or have followed me at all, paint color is the very last thing that I decide. I'm just creating a palette based on things that I know I'm going to use. I base this palette on what I saw as commonalities among all of Ina's things. And Ina had quite a bit of artwork, and fortunately, it had some similarities. I decided where I was going to use the bigger pieces first, and I also managed to find her a couple of abstracts that were large and that she just happened to love. I knew the combination of all of these things would create the perfect color palette. Having artwork that you love is an excellent place to begin work on a soulful home. If you don't have much artwork yet, or maybe you don't have any artwork to speak of right now, well, now is a great time to collect a piece that you love. Now, I did not say go buy an expensive piece. I said get yourself a piece that you love. Start small and grow your collection. Take your time. Collect pieces that you truly love and that are meaningful. This doesn't happen overnight. You can always layer them in over time and you can leave space for them as you work. But in Ina's case, she had a lot of artwork and I knew it was already meaningful to her. So I used it as a jumping off point to get this palette started. And of course, 
Artwork is not the only place that you can start the process of creating a soulful home. You can start with anything that you love and build from there. The only rule is you must love it and it must speak to you in some way. I love this quote from Christy Ford. Surround yourself with what you love so that your house has a soul. Collect, don't decorate. Now, you've heard me say before on this very podcast that if every single thing in your home has a meaning, then you will never finish. And I really do mean this. So here's a little formula that you can use. The things that are non-meaningful are what I call filler. And you will need some filler. But to create a soulful home, you will only want about 20% filler. And the remainder, like your artwork, Books, things that you love, photos of friends and family, live flowers and plants, and your everyday pieces. These should be items that are meaningful. It's the old 80-20 rule. 80% meaningful and 20% filler. Well, if you do this, you've got a winner. So now, in Ina's case, we have a colorful palette. And in this case, Ina had quite a lot of rich greens, hot pinks, and deep blues. Rich, deep, and vibrant colors. Her things were very global, and I began to see a little chinoiserie and grand millennial style and feel emerge. It's a style that lends itself to a global, well-traveled vibe. It embodies color, and it's a style that is easily layered. Plus, I knew it would speak to Ina's ease and need for elegance. It's also fresh and energetic. Ina said to me over and over, I do not want this new space to feel like a downsize. I want it to feel clever and fresh and anything but old ladyish. Well, Ina, I got you there. Step four in creating a soulful home is to determine a mood and a feeling that you're going to create. This in most design references is called your style. But I think instead, it's rather more about a mood that you're trying to create. When people say coastal, I don't think of it as a style. I think of it as a mood. When people say industrial chic, to me, this is a mood. Your style is a bit different as it's a unique combination of elements that scream you. Combining your style with a mood is a surefire way to create a home that has a soul. Take your style quiz in episode three, and this will help you determine the direction in which to go. I also knew That in Ina's case, I needed to keep things modern and fresh and that I could incorporate a tiny bit of mid-century modern, which really works well with a chinoiserie and grand millennial feeling, and that I could also incorporate some abstract artwork to enliven the paintings that she already had, and this would breathe fresh, new, modern life into the overall design. So now we're off to step five, and this is truly where the magic begins. We're going to layer it all in by adding textiles. Fabrics are the magic that makes it all work. Ina already owns some beautiful fabric draperies and quite a few pillows that we could use. Again, I culled and I assessed. Here again, this might be a good time to to consult a designer or a trusted friend or even a drapery workroom to see what is possible with what you might already have. Now, I do mean trusted friend or relative, someone with knowledge of you and someone who has great taste. This doesn't always work out, and in this case, I recommend that you simply hire a design professional for a couple hours of consult. This is why sometimes a designer is the right fit and is worth the consult just to have fresh eyes on what you should keep. We all become tunnel visioned, sometimes me included in my own home, which is actually why Ina called me in the first place 
It just so happened we hit it off and we took it a lot of steps further. She loved it all and couldn't decide. She loved everything in her house and couldn't decide what to keep and what to let go of. She was wise to realize that this was a problem and knew that her existing 6,000 square feet of things was not going to fit into a 2,500 square foot space. She also knew that she was too tunnel visioned to eliminate what needed to go and that if she had tried this on her own, she risked creating non-functioning clutter. Ultimately, Irie made several of her drapery treatments that would fit into the new spaces with little alteration. I also, in a couple of cases, just used the drapery panels without the toppers that she already had. This created a more modern approach. I reupholstered a small antique prayer bench that was interesting and that I wanted to use in the foyer space by cutting up one of her drapery treatments simply for the upholstery. Another drapery treatment became toss pillows and another became a foot pillow throw at the end of a guest bedroom. When you have beautiful draperies and you're downsizing, moving, or changing your lifestyle, well, you certainly can reuse them. You just want to do so in a way that makes positive impact and that is easy on the budget. As a side note, remaking draperies is an expensive endeavor. So you want to make sure it's not less expensive necessarily in the long run as the workroom has to remove and take apart all of the existing pieces. It does become worthwhile, however, if you have beautiful, luxurious, expensive fabrics with which to work. In Ina's case, she did. If it's just plain linens or some simple pieces, it's really just best to start over. I've removed trim from items like these. However, again, you really have to evaluate the cost of a remake versus the cost of just starting from the beginning. All right, we're now into step six. And in step six, we consider our floor plan. It is here that I began to place the furnishings and to decide where things would go. I do this on paper first by graphing out the space and cutting furniture into little paper doll-like shapes. I am then able to move them all around the space on paper, but not physically. The main thing to remember here is to start with a focal point per room by determining what elephants and large pieces exist in your space. What is it that you must work with and then determine how you're going to incorporate these pieces. Can your focal point work with the function of the space? Can these two elements get married? More about focal points and furniture arranging if you just simply go to episode 17. In arranging your furniture, you also want to keep a watch on how this affects the mood and the style of the spaces. These elements go hand in hand with the overall effect. For example, in Ina's case, she told me that the spaces that she needed needed to accommodate her love of reading, that she enjoyed entertaining inside and outside, that she painted a little bit and needed a space in which to do this, that she also watched a little TV, but it wasn't a big thing to her, and she needed a place to pay bills and keep files, and she loves to cook. I incorporated a reading nook in her living room area along with a dining table that she previously owned that doubled as a sofa table that held books and sort of looked like a library, but could easily be converted to an entertaining piece. I created a large island in the kitchen area by recrafting the kitchen area just a wee bit and this doubled as a space for Ina to have daily meals and eliminated the need for a kitchen breakfast table. The breakfast area became a TV nook, complete with bookshelves and comfy seating in case Ina wanted to read here or have morning coffee as well. 
I had a couple of her older, less expensive pieces linexed, which is finished in an all-weather protective coating, and relegated them to her patio garden area so that we can incorporate the outdoor space into her daily living and certainly into entertaining. In Ina's case, creating a soulful home meant taking into consideration her need for function and how the home must perform and then incorporating it into spaces in a way that would allow them to multifunction. If you can, in your brain, unassign the formal name for a space in your head, then you can open it up for a different use and different purpose. In Ina's case, I turned the formal dining room into a home office and made it very handsome and study-like. This space became the most well-traveled of them all, and I was able to incorporate some custom bookshelves and filing cabinets that incorporated a lot of Ina's personal things that she had collected throughout her travels. I also left blank spaces for future travels. To keep the space from looking contrived, I added a very large abstract painting. This also invited in a little modernity. So, Consider having rooms double for some of your purposes. In this case, a little easel in the new home office accommodated a love of painting and a storage bin incorporated into the new bookshelves helped held the paint supplies in an organized fashion. A patina dining table in the living room created instant soul and doubled the functionality of the space. A breakfast nook in the kitchen was converted to a TV nook and could be used for small gatherings of close friends and family, but was a great spot for morning coffee, reading, and TV watching. And on and on it goes. Believe me, if you can incorporate daily functions and rituals into your spaces, then the soul of your home will automatically appear. It's important for you to assess how you live, and what you like to do in your spaces. If you know this, then you can easily incorporate these things into your daily living. And this is probably the number one key to how to add soul to your spaces because it's your soul that you're adding. Well, that was a heavy dose, but we still have a little ways to go. Step seven is adding in architectural elements with purpose. As you assess how the space is going to perform, it's important to also assess whether or not you need to add architectural elements. Architectural elements are in this case defined as pieces or structures that add a beauty or stylish element or pieces that add functionality. In Ina's case, I determined that she had a lot of beautiful things already. And remember, I was on a bit of a budget, so I couldn't just go out and buy all new things. Ina knew she had a bevy of stuff already, so convincing her to start all over would almost have been sacrilegious. I also knew that to make this new space function, it would have to have good bones and that this would be where I would need to spend some of the budget. I chose to do three architectural things. In the first, I added crown molding to the space, and I made it significant. The space had a very small piece of crown already, but if anything, it was distracting. I wanted chunky crown because the ceilings were 10 feet high, and it would help with the scale. But most importantly, Ina had beautiful, bold things, and they would overpower the space if the space couldn't stand on its own. So, I added crown throughout. This was a purely decorative choice. Next, I knew that her kitchen would be the soul of the soul of the home. So, I made it user-friendly. I worked with an organizer to set the kitchen up perfectly in terms of drawers and cabinets and their arrangements. 
I have several future episodes dedicated just to how to organize your spaces once and for all, so you'll definitely want to stay tuned for this. But I needed to make sure that every drawer and every cabinet functioned. This was a downsize after all. I also knew I wanted to open the kitchen up a bit and add an island. I kept the existing cabinets as is, as the budget really wouldn't allow for new ones. But I moved the stove out of the existing island, gave up a small bank of cabinets that included a desk, and repositioned it there. Then I retopped the island while adding cabinets to it, giving back the cabinet space that I lost to accommodate the stove. This also created an island eating space and prep space that became the center and the heartbeat of the kitchen and, well, I might as well just say, of the home. This allowed me to eliminate the need for a breakfast nook, which I repositioned into a TV reading and small entertaining nook. And the third and final functioning architectural element that I added was built-in bookshelves in the home office that incorporated filing storage. Ina liked to have spaces for real paperwork and documents. She didn't want to have all of her documents saved to tech, and this really is a personal preference. So, we incorporated a filing cabinet in the base of one of the bookshelves and a home safe in another. The shelves could then hold decorative objects and memorabilia from her many travels. So, as you're assessing your space, really dig deep. Are each of the spaces supporting you and the way you live to your fullest potential? If not, then please know that none of these elements were neither expensive or complicated. You can pull this off. You just need to first assess what it is that you really need in your home. And now we're to step eight, which is choosing your wall colors and finishes. I know you thought we would never get here, but I list this step here because this too can be a part of what becomes the soul of your home. Aside from the psychology of color, this is a great expressive way to represent your soul in your home. Perhaps you have your favorite color, and perhaps it belongs on a wall. Perhaps you prefer neutral colors on the walls and pops of color throughout. There's no right or wrong answers. The only thing about right or wrong here is when to select the wall color or wall treatment. I say that's always towards the end. Here's a good rule of thumb. Select the wall color towards the end of the project. This way, you can assess the remainder of the space and let it fly from this point. In Ina's case, I used a few wallpapers in key areas. The foyer, the powder room, and the master bath were wallpapered in patterns that worked with the colors and the style and the mood of the spaces. This created interest, movement, and drama. Because Ina had so many beautiful pieces, I used a bold color in the home office and a medium-toned blue-green in the remaining spaces. I painted the walls and the crown in all of the spaces the same color. Yes, you heard me correctly. I painted the walls and the crown the same color. And while this sounds like an oxymoron since I just spent money on the new crown moldings and now I'm not even highlighting them in a contrasting way, well, this might seem odd to you. But the purpose of doing this is so that there was no competition with the elements in the room. It's really sophisticated to do this. I still have great bones in the space, but I am just presenting a lovely background for Ina's things to shine. Since Ina has a lot of things and bold elements, not breaking the eye up anywhere else in the space is a great idea. Hence, I kept the walls neutralized in their function, even though they were painted a color. This also adds an element of elegance and sophistication to a space like this. And here we are at the end, step nine, 
adding your pizzazz. This is the final and very important step into adding a soul to your home. If you're a person who loves nature and the outdoors, and you're creating more of a rooted feel to your space, well, consider incorporating antique pieces that you love. If you're a very structured, minimalist person, consider using a black and white color scheme that incorporates meaningful art and sculptures to your spaces. If you're a lamb personality type who is a cozy nester, layer spaces with textures, textiles, family photos, and plants. If you are a tiger personality like Ina, who is a bit of a globetrotter, we incorporated a lot of her travels, but we also incorporated some Shazam as well. I reupholstered her sofa in her main living space in a tiger print velvet, and that said it all. Then I fluffed it with pillows made from her previous draperies, and the result was stunning, appropriate, fresh, and dramatic, and anything but old ladyish. I can assure you that you would never walk in this space and think old lady. So, what can we learn from today's lesson? Mainly, that incorporating a soul into your home has to start with expressing your soul. I am not a designer who much believes in walking into picture-perfect spaces that are gorgeous, but that hold no meaning. Instead, I say you can have both picture-perfect and soulful. With a little imagination, assessment of how you really live, and repurposing what you already own, you are well on your way to creating spaces that you love, but also spaces that resonate with you. So, I hope you'll follow these 10 suggestions and steps for creating a soulful home, and I hope you'll let me know how it all worked out. Please send me your photos and your questions to Kimberly at KimberlyGriggDesigns.com. And just know, I would love to know what you think about this podcast. It's easy to do so. Just go to the upper right-hand side of the podcast and click follow. We'll then drop into your library every Wednesday. Then, if you would kindly rate and review, this lets us know how we are doing. You will also be helping other design lovers find us. I thank you for this, and I thank you for listening. And as I like to say, don't wait. Today is a great day to decorate. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to Decorate Like a Design Boss. If you want more info on how to decorate your space like a pro, visit KimberlyGriggDesigns.com. See you next week.